Alexander Williamson here with the secret history inside of your aquarium. Uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of pop on here. I'm going to do a live stream. I was going to do a video update um, and in that format, but I figure why not do a live stream, see who's around, and uh, you guys can always watch it later. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Now let me flip you around so you can see. I wanted to talk a little bit about this aquascape. So, pardon the glass and the glare um, being a little bit dirty and all that, but basically, this is a new aquascape for me, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the fundamentals of aquascaping and how you can make the most of what you have and how to maximize the... Uh, the rocks you have and the plants you have and how to trick the human eye into uh, depth and balance and where it's going to be directed. Um, the first thing that I want to show you on this aquascape is that I have planted it pretty heavily and um, I had uh, the fortune of having a sail uh, as well as some uh, points earned essentially uh, at a local fish shop and so I had a whole bunch of ADF brand tissue culture cups that are normally like 12 bucks or something like that uh, and I got them like 35% off or something when all was said and done so um, I've got those in here and I've got six cups of plants in this little 20 gallon tank um, let me describe what's going on a little bit and then we will get into um, some of the fundamentals of the aquascaping and how I've set this up for success in the future. So first of all, the substrate is not how it's going to be permanently. And in aquascaping art and architecture, there are two major principles. Um, that serve as templates and the first one is called the rule of thirds and the second one is called the golden ratio. Now both of these are very ancient uh, guidelines and they're very helpful for letting you figure out how to lay out an aquarium, lay out uh, an art piece or whatever it may be, the way you're planting, the height of the plants, the density, the color, um, it all can come into play. So the first thing you do with either one is you figure out where your focal point is going to be, where your eye is drawn. And for this tank, I would say it's in here, maybe somewhere in here. But you've got a focal point, and then as you read the tank, because we have been taught to read left to right in the Western world or the exact opposite um, in some cultures, so uh, and then Japanese so but it doesn't matter if it's in the center of the tank or way off to one side your eye will skip those rules and go towards the center of mass or the bright color or whatever's eye catching so the focal point in this tank happens to be this large stone and so this stone here is actually set back all the way against the back glass and it is towering over the other stones and basically when you set up a stone uh, scape you want in the in the traditional Japanese Iwagumi Gumi style uh, you want to have the rock being the feature and the plants helping serve that end and then in the uh, Amano or natural style uh, planting of tanks you're going to want to have the whole scene look like a miniature of nature. So this should look like a scene that could be, maybe it's on an island or a canyon or maybe it's an oasis. Uh, here in Washington State, we have uh, a lot of areas in the eastern half of the state where um, there's formations of pillars of rock like this that have been washed away by rivers, by the Columbia River and so forth. And then also on the beach we have like haystacks and things on the coast 
that have been eroded by the ocean and wind and time. And so I kind of emulated that model. And when I'm looking at it, so your your focal point is here or, or up here. And the golden spiral or golden ratio is a grid that is laid out lengthwise um, with two, an X and a Y axis that are not uh, proportional. And they follow that your eye will follow a path like this and read it well, an exponential spiral. So the weight should be centered in here as it is and comes around and as your eye is following it, there's something about the spiral and then the ratio of those from the center up and down side to side that reads well. So at each curve in the spiral, you've got one, maybe the spiral starts here and then wraps around, comes down here, and then there's more weight over here. This being a slight outlier, but that is kind of uh, the idea of the golden spiral with the golden ratio being more specifically um, the ratio between points in the spiral and how you lay out buildings and peaks. And with triangles in particular, you want the width to be uh, a certain ratio based on the ratio between two points in the spiral. So that is an ancient Greek and Roman uh, technique or tradition, and it has informed our eye today. Along with that, they also like odd numbers. And so you can see here that my main feature stones here, here, and here are an odd number. There's three of them, one being the, the center. And with this, it also follows a rule of thirds in that if you were to divide the tank, there's one section, here's one section, here's one section. So you've got split it in three that way then split it in three, here's one, here's one, here's one. Where all those lines would be gridding, you would have one here, one here, one here, and one here intersecting. And so you want those points to be balanced, or you want an empty space here and an empty space here, or you want all the points taken up by something that catches your eye. That doesn't mean rock necessarily but it means that if you've got red here, maybe you want red here. And then anything else outside of it, say this was all green instead, like dark green, dark green, light green, light green, or um, you know, all solid green, then your outliers outside of that pattern should be on the third bar um, of that, so a third of the way out and then either a third of the way up, and then it would be balanced by having another one that comes up here this tall. And so that's just a trick that in photography, um, the rule of thirds and then the golden ratio are both used heavily, as well as in architecture and art. I've used it heavily in my artwork as well. So you should Google that stuff if you want to find out more about it, because you could talk about that for days. It's a very... Um, very in-depth ancient subject and some people read a lot into it other people think that it's just kind of a, a, a pleasant looking thing um, next I want to talk a little bit about how this how I mimic geology and get depth in in this um, setup so I want to show you the top and when you look into the tank you can see that the pinnacle stone is all the way against the back and the other stones come forward in a, a V shape. So the eye is brought in like this and like this. So yet again, your, your eye is going to that pinnacle stone. Now, we like symmetry as humans, and we think of that as a human trait or a man-made trait. And so when we look at something like the design on this mirror, you see that it's symmetrical. If you split it either this way or this way, uh, you would have the same symmetry. And in nature, rarely does that occur. You may have similar weights, so maybe this rock here that goes up higher than this rock, 
but this one extends farther back. Maybe they're the same weight symmetrically. And a pleasing effect, but it is not a um, it's not a hard and fast rule, and it's more natural to not follow direct symmetry. So in that same vein, the human eye likes odd numbers. So we've got your main stone, and this stone should serve to look monolithic if you're doing a layout like this. This is the Iwagoma style mixed with the Amano style. And it should have, you're trying to create, um, you're trying to create the most uh, perspective and uh, size differential as possible so that your fish, your plants, everything else looks dwarfed. Forgot to silence the phone. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks, man. Thanks, Bentley, uh, for digging the arrangement. I was going to do a video that was like just on hardscaping, um, but then I was like, you know what? I'll just do a live stream and talk a little bit about this tank. So uh, the stone, it I know it kind of looks like Sirius stone or something, but it's actually just a basalt that's from the train tracks down by the beach but it was used as like a reinforcement along the Puget Sound and some of the pieces had crumbled uh, everything except for this piece here which is actually I know YouTube doesn't let me focus but it's actually a blue jadeite and it has some interesting little uh, seams in it and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit too yeah so I and basalt is a little bit um <clears throat> Yeah, I did boil the I boiled the hell out of this stone um, to make sure it was clean. Uh, yeah, and the other thing I did was I know uh, from my geology background in college that this stone definitely has some iron in it, and the stone around here in general does. And this tank, if you notice, is planted very heavily with. Uh, well, a lot right now because basically I'm throwing a bunch of stuff to the wall and seeing if it sticks. But I've got like a Rotala Rotunda pink and then I've got um, a Vietnam strain that's also pink. I've got uh, Rotala Wolikia. Uh, I've got uh, uh, Crips, the Axel Radi, and the um, Undulata. And all of these have red in them and if a plant has red in it there's probably a pretty good chance that it wants iron so let me just dis discuss that a little bit more so i've got iron uh supplement let me grab that real quick that i use just some flourish iron as well as root tabs and right now the substrate has seen better days but i'm still in the phase of planting and moving things around and fiddling with how i want things uh, and so there's no sense in capping it off with sand, which I want to do. And the cool thing about capping it off with sand like it is over here is one, it, it contrasts the darkness up here, but two, it also allows you to see where your shrimp and your fish and snails and things have been traveling. And so you get little footprints and tracks, and then you can see where fish have bedded down or dug, and that's kind of cool. But as far as gravel vacking and stuff, you're not going to keep that sand look. It's really to snap a couple pictures. And uh, that goes back to uh, what I've said in other videos that I think there are, when, when thinking about functionality, there are two types of aquascapes. The first one is an aquascape that you can use and you can breed fish in like this. There's endlers that are being breeded. I can scoop out anything in here easily. Um, there are blue uh, shrimp in here and right now there's nothing the the colony of shrimp is very small and it's not very pure and so I want to totally grab all three to six shrimp that are in there and uh, remove them and start another project of better um, bloodline for the shrimp so um but basically, uh, and then I've also got some little tetras, uh, some ruby tetras. I like them a lot also for uh, photogenic reasons in that they have a nice contrast. And yes, they do look red on, on the, that, that matches the rocks or complements the rocks. 
But the way they move, they often school together, and so there'll be three of them in a formation or six of them in a formation, but then they move and then they stop, and then they move and they stop. Um, no, these rubies weren't at last month's meeting. Uh, I wish they were, uh, or I wish I'd bought some because I need some more for this tank. I just love how they've turned out looking in this tank. I also am torn on... So I've got some nature. Let me scoot some light onto this too. So I've got some a tangerine shrimp, a red female, but let me scoot in here and try to find you guys. This is dirty. I need to clean it this afternoon. There's a lot of leaf litter, but there's natural shrimp with some really cool like tiger stripe markings in yellow and purple and black. And so they're culls from from some lesser grade tangerine shrimp uh, and also from some some of these guys um, who are all about to, to um, molt to, ah, sorry. Um, but you can see the ones that are whitish are gonna molt and the ones that are the true red uh, already have. So those babies are coming along well. I'll probably bring those to my local fish club meeting soon um, as well as Maybe some of the blues, they'll probably be one more month. Um, but yeah, so those shrimp, I'm thinking about putting some natural shrimp in here. I've also got the Ancestress uh, in here that loves this wood. I'm not sure if this wood will stay. Uh, what do I feed my shrimp? Um, I feed my shrimp a mix of things. So I will feed them green beans and like broccoli and uh, blanched or um, like flash boiled uh, veggies on a little tray, uh, the tray being over there like a petri dish, or I'll then give them uh, pretty regularly, I give them uh, Hikari crab cuisine. And then I also sprinkle just a tad bit of fish uh, flakes in the tank as well and then you can see this tank acts as my holding tank for extra plants so any plants that I'm debating like what I'm going to do with there a lot of them are floating so that I can move around and get at things but I've also got crypts in here and other low-lying plants um, and mosses that then I can pull out and put into other tanks uh, but yeah I feed them that and then the algae and the um, other life forms that the microorganisms that are in the water they seem to filter feed and thrive off of. Right now you can see, uh, you might remember that I had a massacre in the shrimp tank when my gudgeons got out and killed over 70 uh, percent, but it looks like the cherry shrimp are rebounding for sure. I've got some baby blue shrimp in there too. The females, uh, the day after they gave birth, they came back into this tank. So that's kind of, oh, and there, there is my uh, Calico Pleco. Yet again, on, um, on uh, YouTube, I can't play with contrast or anything, but it's a nice looking fish um, on the rock. It kind of blends in, and I'm, I'm happy with it. I've named her Callie, I decided, and she's doing a nice job right there. You can see where she cleared off some of the algae in the background. Now I don't have CO2 pumping through this tank yet and I think this afternoon I'm gonna set that up because a lot of these plants need it. We've got Rotella wallichia, which I just uploaded a video discussing, uh, but that's like a very gentle plant. And when you're, when you're doing a scape like this that you want to look almost like this could be outside and a human would be this big and it's like a big boulder formation or something, um, you really want to uh, do plants that aren't going to overpower the rocks. And this temple compacta, or, or whatever you want to call it, crimson temple, small temple, um, it is probably not the smart choice long term, but I will keep it trimmed. And that will stay nice and low um, if I stay on top of that. But that is almost like my tree line. Um, whereas if I put some kabamba or this rotala that's in here, um, it almost looks like pine trees or something with those fine little needles. And then down here, we've got more of like fern action. And uh, with the crypts and things, we've kind of got like a jungly underbrush 
or even like a, you know, a cactus type or a aloe vera type thing. Uh, little side note, this tank also, since I use the golden ratio, I've moved all of my snails in here that are golden. Uh, they're albino, but they are a gold at ram's horn snails. Uh, yeah, I do have some uh, repents in here. Um, let's see, where is it at? It's kind of tucked around. That stick of a plant is actually one that my um, Pelvica chromis tenadius uh, decided to munch on. There's some right up in there. So in here, this is the improbable. So at, with a geology background, let me get back to the, the aquascape hardscape. This formation um, is supposed to draw your eye in. It's weighted and symmetrical, but not perfectly symmetrical, and it utilizes odd numbers. So I have seen this in my head as a formation that had uplift for millions of years, and then everything around this uh, softer sand and soil eroded away and left these columns or, or hoodoos uh, if they get bigger at the top. And then the wind swirling around has, has eroded them. You need to have a story when you're working on a hardscape that is supposed to resemble a miniature um, diorama scene of a landscape. If you're doing a scene that just looks like it's out of a, a river bottom, then that's not as important. You could put a big old piece of driftwood in, um, but here scale is everything. And so down in here, we've got like uh, miniature dwarf hair grass, which seems redundant for the name, but all of that is going to be a low growing plant. And with this light, it's an aquia sky uh, fluval, but it will grow relatively slow under this light, but it's enough light that it's not going to be unhealthy. And then with the CO2, I'll probably do CO2 every other day or just a really slow everyday CO2 um, because I don't want the plants going crazy, but I do want color in them. And also uh, with CO2 and ferts, you can sometimes make your shrimp a little bit uncomfortable. Um, AKA dead. So, so you got to be careful with dosing some of those things with the nitrates and your fish too, if you get really crazy. But the improbable part of this landscape that I've laid out is this piece here. And this piece is actually a jadeite piece and you can't see it well in this video. Um, let me see if I can fiddle with the lights and maybe you can see it better, but it has some banding on it that let's see here that, uh, is bluish gray in to my eye when I see it here in person and it has these lines in it that are going this way and a couple this way too but that tells you which way the rock formed and when you're doing a hardscape you have to pay attention to that so as with this you can see that there is a layer of which it was laid down even though it's been broken and crumbled glaciation in the Puget Sound has caused these rocks to cleave like this. You can see where they probably used a power drill to uh, cut the stone for uh, the bulkhead they were making where I got these stones that had kind of tumbled down into the water. And uh, I've have videos on how to process stones so that they're safe, but you still need to pick stones that aren't covered in uh, by the train tracks is dangerous because they have a lot of creosote and other chemicals and things that come off the trains and that they treat the wood with on the tracks so that it doesn't rot, but it is nasty stuff for your fish and for you for that matter. Um, so I had to make sure that this stuff was far enough away from that and that it had been in the water long enough that it was, it was free of that. And so... <clears throat> when we're looking at this, the story that I was talking about, you can see that this has grains going this way. And this feature here, I've tried to put bright green plants in between those gaps as I have here in these recesses so that your eye sees that, wow, that's a big dark wall. And depending on where the light's at, you can really exaggerate Hold on one sec. Let me get this straightened away. You can you can have it all the way so that um, you know you see 
the texture of the rock but not the recesses or you can scoot it back and you can really exaggerate those dark faces and shadows and things like that and make it look even more uh, heavy or monolithic, um, especially when you're down below at this angle. From above, uh, it looks less so. But let me, let me take you above again. And also, here's that golden ram, ram's horn snail that's albino um, that has the golden ratio spiral which I think is cool, and I've got, I think there's five in here now. They're reproducing slowly, and I have to cull a lot. But you can see in this tank, let me take this up higher, that I'll use the light as a pointer. But in the front, we've got a V, so that your eye is drawn all the way back to here. Love how you put the rockscape. Oh, thank you, man. That's what, yeah, that's kind of what I'm talking about is how some of the tricks and tips on doing this and how uh, being an artist for my entire, entire life and adult life for a living has really helped inform this. Even though this is one of the first tanks where I've, you know, gone and sought out the Latin name plants and tissue cultures. Other times I've done a lot of scaping per se, but I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know the background on it. And so it's kind of cool to come revisit it. Something that I've been doing just on a budget for years, <clears throat> you know, go to the local lake and pull out some <laughs> milfoil or whatever and use that as the background plant. And then, you know, use some sort of pine sl or pond slime in the foreground and rocks found at the beach otherwise. But when we're looking at this, we've got a shape that definitely is intended to draw the eye in. So you, you've you got this and this drawing the eye back to this point. And you can see that that main rock in this tank is really only a third of the way back. So I'm using the rule of thirds also in that uh, proportion and dimension. And I've also made up the story in my head that this rock that has this blue hue here that is a jadeite rock with some quartz banding in it that it is the same as this pillar and I've kind of faked it so that that in my head this was a pillar that was probably yay tall and over time it has fallen um, so you can see here that I've left space and that kind of fakes out and it comes at a slope that yet again is building up to that focal point uh, but it kind of fakes you out to show the aging process and that this may be a real geological site and that maybe this blue hard stone which draws your eye in and is not oriented the way the rest are that's like this thick bulky basalt Maybe that's the core of these rocks, just like you get gold and quartz as the core of uh, many other things, depending on how it forms. Um, yeah, so you saying it's almost like the coast of Maine. So I drew a lot of inspiration from the coast of Washington and Oregon, where we get these big hoodoos and arches and things like that. Um, and basically, if you step back, I'll explain that... These are all plants that are going to grow low and slow and carpet. And I'm going to add sand carefully in between to be less distracting with the dark that's in there from my last substrate. There's root tabs buried underneath uh, this, probably about eight in total in the tank strategically placed. And then there are about nine species of plants, which is a little bit of overkill, honestly. I could have gotten rid of, you know, planting here, planting here. Back in here is really busy, but I kind of wanted the weight of the dark red that will come out in these crypts. I kind of wanted that and uh, also like the false fern look of some of these plants and bushes or almost like a... a, a I don't know, some sort of tree. I wanted that to be apparent down low so that the rocks are even more powerful. Now, the part that I can't decide on yet is the mid-level plants. So then I've got these uh, planted, the compacta. Uh, it's like a crimson red stem with big leaves. And I think... Um, 
Yeah, so I'm just reading a comment saying that you should have more plants. So yeah, that is a concern of mine because of the balance of the tank, especially with all the ferts, and then once I hook up the CO2, I don't want my fish to be uncomfortable, and I like tanks that take care of themselves, and I'll show you in a moment <laughs> how crazy my other tanks are uh, at, the, at this time because I've been focusing so much on this one. So I'm going to scoot the light back so we can look at some stuff. Um, but essentially, uh, in this tank, we've also got a back row of plants. And so I've used this as a store. And so I've got, um, what about small, medium height, uh, Achenodorus plants, Amazon swords. Um, so yeah, um, that is a good question. I have uh, a couple, where is one? Here is one, uh, a sword plant, but I have kind of decided that those leaves are too broad and these are the biggest leaves I want to see in the tank because that's going to detract from the, the uh, size and the ratio of this, these rocks if they were a cliff. And even these guppy females are pushing too big for me. I'd like some chili rasboras or something with red in them that hint back at the crimson, purple, and red that's gonna be throughout the landscape. And then blue is the polar opposite, and so the shrimp are these uh, royal blue shrimp, and they're hanging out, you know, doing their shrimpy thing. Uh, but these plants will grow, and as you see, they have pink crowns or crimson crowns, and they have really fine feathering. And so this entire back area is loaded with cultured starts. I think I cut it up into about 25 pieces in another video. And then that will grow up high here. Uh, I don't know if I will keep that. It depends on how it looks. If it takes away from the, the bulk and the volume of this stone, then my plan is to take red uh, root floaters and carpet the top with that so there's almost a crimson root skyline hanging down like this that doesn't challenge in a real scale the the shape of the the scape here, the hardscape. So this is a Iwagumi style in that the rock is the star of it. It's the rock star. Um, also, the other thing I wanted to show you is that there are, yeah, narrow leaf crypts. See, these are, I've got a lot of crypts in here. I've got four types of crypts, but mostly like the ones that I loaded up a full uh, AD, ADF, which is ADA's American counterpart, it, basically out of California. I loaded it up with uh, axelrod and axelrod eye, and then also um, undulata. And then I also have. Uh, what else have I got in here? I've got Pogo Stem on uh, Hell Fairy, uh, which is kind of a cool low and slow uh, bright green plant. And that kind of will peek through here and here um, and hint at uh, depth. So we'll get some more uh, depth going on. And so it's almost like this is a mid-level shrubs. These are your trees. And then anything above that is going to be, you know, we'll pretend that in a scale, this is t maybe 20 to 40 feet tall. And this is 100 feet tall or 120 feet tall uh, outcropping of rocks. And that's why this is a little out of scale. That would be a massive oak tree or something. So it's all about scale and tricking the eye. I went over the golden ratio and the rule of thirds just very briefly and showing you how I used both of those. And you want the tank when it's when you're looking at it, the weight to feel like it's it's uh reasonable. So a little bit symmetrical, but not totally because people like symmetry. It shows that effort went into it, and we look for those things in nature because it's such a humanizing uh, style of art to do symmetry. Cut it down the middle, it looks the same. If you look at a human face, uh, like mine, sorry, it's a little dark, I am not symmetrically perfect. And when people are completely symmetrically perfect, people find it weird. Um, but when it's just slightly off by like 2%, 3%, they really like it. So 
This will grow tall in the back. I don't know if I'm gonna keep it. I am concerned, man, I need to get rid rid of notifications. I don't know if you guys can hear those, but I'm sorry if you do. Um, yes, so I'm glad you brought that up. Nature is not symmetrical, it is fractalized. And that means that I've got symmetry here in weight. This rock and this rock weigh the same-ish, but they're oriented differently. So there's the pleasing effect of that, you know, this was intentional, or it's a little bit random enough that maybe it wasn't intentional, but also the pyramid apex kind of look is, is not totally natural. Like, you, that's a rare occurrence, naturally. And also we've got that shape here, and then we've got the broken column that has kind of fallen like that. We've got maybe a river washed through here and eroded away this chunk from the platform here, from this out, outcropping. Same with here, and you've got the banding going this way, along with that way here. And then here, we've got the banding going this way, and with that, it falls down, and then it still keeps with that story. So that's why it's important to read the rock, and in this case, I don't have the money to go get Sirius Stone or Dragon Stone. I would love to work with it. I would love if someone has a tank that they want to like hand over for me to play with. I would love that and I would um, treat it mighty fine. But um, I'd love one of those big long ones. But this is just a 20 gal uh, I got at the Petco sale this year, like a couple months ago. And I broke it in, not really scaped. And then I decided I'm going all in and I've totally rescaped everything. Um, and it's kind of my Endler breeding tank, and then I hope for it to be a blue shrimp colony. So other than that, it doesn't need a ton of buffering from plants, but there are a lot of plants in here right now for the aesthetic of uh, Iwag Iwagumi style, um, you know, slash natural tank a little bit. Um, for that style, but you can see the blue shrimp here. So there's nothing else really that's got that blue in the tank. And so I really like that. The Ancestress uh, is a calico and it's got nice yellow fins that when it's on the rock, you see the fins and it's in its eyebrows. The Ruby Tetras have just a slight hint of blue in their, in their fin, but it's mostly red and then clear. And then like I said, both they and the Leopard Endlers uh, which are rainbow leopard endlers from uh, Lucas Bretz, who's just friggin' phenomenal guy uh, for raising fish and shrimp. Um, and you can see here the, the fish are having actually kind of a tough time navigating through how dense some of this uh, bottom foliage is. So, yeah, I just, I want to have enough of a buffer that it that it's, keeps the fish sh safe. And there you can see that that's what I was talking about. So it almost looks like I bought this fish. Almost looks like it was made for the scape. Like, I think she just looks perfect on the scape. Uh, and so that comment about nature being fractalized is totally correct. So you, what you're doing is you're repeating patterns. So you've got this big pillar, then you got another pillar, then you got another pillar, then you got a smaller pillar, and all these small pillars reinforce the fact that the apex is the heaviest largest piece and that that scale-wise that goes on. Same with you've got shrubs and then you've got trees and then you've got maybe your highline forest. And that's why I'm worried that my Rotala Vietnam and my Rotala Rotundra pink and Wallachia are all, they're all the right color and they've got that fine leaf um, look to them. But when they grow up all the way higher, it has to almost be a sheer curtain or it will take the viewer out of, out of belief. And it'll also cut down on the contrast between these rocks. And so I don't like that, but we'll see how it goes. And I do like the more plants that I can fit in the tank, the better. Also, I'll probably, as I see where the grass naturally wants to grow with the root tabs and the fertilizer I've put in, I'll probably be um, sanding over like this peppered stuff and making some paths because I love seeing 
the tracks of the shrimp and things like that in in the water um, in the sand. So let me take you over right now. This is another tank that is a mess right now. It had a case of ick that turned into fish itching at themselves or, or rubbing on themselves and then got secondary infections and there was a bacterial infection. And I think I've lost, cut the tops off the Rotala and replant them in the... Yeah, so that is exactly what I do, Shadden0040, is I cut off the top and uh thanks man i appreciate you saying you like you like how it looks this tank used to be scaped pretty nicely um i've made a pile over here none of these rocks are the right type so there's no there's no miniature diorama effect or nature tank going on or iwagumi Iwa style tank this is definitely going to end up being like a Dutch or a jungle style underwater garden where I'm just growing plants. I got big old uh, red fire ferns um, and I've also got, you know, wisteria, water sprite, more rotala, more repents, um, and then more... Um, these were supposed to be panda guppies, but their mother I don't think was quite correct, so they're actually like this... Uh, crazy turquoise blue finned almost panda guppy and they're, they're young they're still growing in their fins apologize that I can't focus when I'm on this like YouTube live stream thing um, but yeah so that's what's going on in here and I think that this tank uh, I'm gonna get some carpeting plants and maybe pump some co2 into here also get a paintball size canister and um i wish you could have seen this tank before i dismantled it because when the ick and the bacterial infection started i moved i used to have a scape that was another uh golden spiral inspired sh shape also you can see here the gudgeons i've rehomed and they like this rock, and they've been living in the rock. I want to see if it'll crawl. Yep, there it goes, into its little burrow. I think they have fry coming soon, because the male has been hanging out in that rock just like that for the last two days, and he's been pretty territorial. Um, but in any case, something was killing off a good number of fish in here. So I treated it with general cure. Uh, Love of Masal is a dog dewormer. And then also um, Ick X, uh, which I always have a giant bottle of just in case. Because um, with guppies, they sure get Ick a lot. And same with the Tetras. I lost four Tetras, which was a real bummer. Neon green Tetras. Other than that, I lost uh, one catfish and a rainbow fish. And uh, let's see what's, what's being said. Uh, let's see here. Plans on doing a Blackwater Amazonian tank? I know you will make that look incredible. Yeah, no, I really wanted to. This tank was going to be a Venezuelan tank, and then what happened was the gudgeon, the peacock gudgeons, turned out to be little bastards, basically, and the rainbow fish that I got for free from a, a F F Florida um, farm... Uh, fish farmer, uh, as well as the thread fins and the fork tails, which all were in this tank. This was going to be an Australian and Papua New Guinea, like thread fin, fork tail, um, gudgeon. Uh, I'm trying to think what else would have been in there, but basically a tank of Australian plants and animals. It didn't work out. It was really hard to import anything interesting other than rainbow fish, which I love, but they deserve better than a 20 gallon. And so I move them to the 40 gallon, which has a bow front and enough room for them to move. This is a really janky light setup right now. And I'm hoping that when I trade in what I show you next, um, that maybe I can buy a new light. So um, basically this tank is no CO2, no special lights, just homemade LEDs that I made out of aluminum stripping and... Uh, it's like the stripping that a door or a screen would run on. And then I just took a, a rubber um, coated waterproof LED strip that puts out like 17 par or something like that from the bottom of the tank. When my friend read it, 
Um, so it's, it's decent, but it's all white light. It doesn't have the full range like my other tanks down here. My shrimp tank and my storage of plants tank. Uh, this tank is really the one that I plan on babying in the near future. Uh, ah, sorry about the zoom in. Um, but yeah, so I'm stoked on that tank to see how it grows in. It's going to be a lot of trimming and maintenance, but I find that fun. I don't find that a pain. This tank, I'm hoping to cover up my aquascaping sins of mixing all these rocks and just doing it river style. You can see where I used to have this, this stick here. Everything came out from this side and this side was down low and it basically spiraled up to a climax here. And uh, if you followed the tank, it, w it started low here and there was a rock rim on the back and it got higher and higher until the rock was all the way up to here. And then that this thing was flipped the exact opposite way and there was red and green with it. Um, yeah, um, let's see, flame moss would look good on that wood. Yeah, I've tried moss on the wood um, and it, it looks great. The only thing is that my fish seem to pick at it. So if I do moss on it again, I'm gonna do Java. You can actually see the moss sitting down there. But this is another tank where like I've got a reserve of plants hiding uh, in the corners. You can probably see back in here, just tons of plants. I always keep some floating too, with roots starting to grow at different spots so I can cut the crowns and use the crowns in different tanks for like miniature reasons. But basically this one has had, it was neon green two days ago before I did the 50% water change. Today I'll do another 20% another 20% tomorrow, and hopefully it'll be on its way back to normal. But I think I threw off the cycle just a little bit, which is a bummer. Uh, this is the first tank that I set up in this apartment. Uh, and if you remember it at all, if you've seen it, it used to look like it was scaped, but now it's all about these two. So the Pelvica Chromis, Cenateus, Nigerian Reds, um, uh, yeah, are, you're mentioning freshwater clams. Uh, did you see uh, uh, Lucas Brett's video on his uh, pink clams? I was giving him crap saying, how many times are you going to use the pink clam uh, in this video? But yeah, he had him cleaning up his green water pretty well. Um, so that's, that is a cool idea. So far, I haven't gotten any green water. The closest thing to green water I've got is my, my own... Uh, intentionally caused and that is I put fertilizer up in here in these dwarf baby tears um, and I've put them at the top of the water next to the aeration and I give them fertilizers and a root tab and this was and you can't even see it anymore but it was like a bonsai tree and another thing happened in here where some shrimp got out and I had to net them and so where this had been, like, it's still, everything's still growing just fine, but it's way too dense. So I need to trim it down, probably bring some plants into my local club or hopefully swap for some shrimp or something. I've also got java fern up the yin yang. This whole back section is packed tight with java fern that is really tall. Like, like that's touching bottom and it's hanging out of the tank that much. So it's like at least two feet tall of java fern. It's starting to grow. This tank just has some guppies, but really it's just about these two. They're my babies. I feed them by hand a couple times a day, in the morning and at night, and then late at night. They were spawning in the coconut cave, but the snails got to them, to their eggs. And so I was talking to Steve from Aquarium Zen, and he was saying that he used to raise these, and that basically they have to learn how to be parents and sometimes your your first brood or batch of eggs gets, um, you know, fungi because they don't like keep it oxygenated enough or whatever. But I need to add more sand and these little buggers drive me nuts because I get them what they want. I get them a little hide and they're using it. I think I'm going to move it off into the corner and just redo this whole scape, which is not a scape anymore. Um, but you can see all the sand that I've put into this tank. It's bulging up here because I keep doing layers of sand. They keep picking up stone and filtering the sand and then 
piling stone, and not that it's like a formation that I can read, but to them it must mean something because they've moved like more white stuff around here and I don't know. So they move around the stones and it's some courting thing. She's been doing her shimmy shake and dance again after she stopped for a while. They like this root area and that's why I haven't messed with the fact that this tree actually like fell forward. Let me get rid of this for a sec. I'll show you this little bonsai that I made. And this is another like hardscaping, aquascaping thing. Um, but basically this thing has Anubius, it has Nana Petite, it has African gold coin, and then it has the really weird use of uh, the Cuban uh, baby tears. Also, I have the, um, the uh, bubble filter, sponge filter. Um, but I probably need to take care of some of this hair algae because it's held this thing together and it stayed in its spot, which is great. And it's allowed it to look like a tree underwater with the roots being all gnarly and, and all that. But now I think it's outgrown its welcome, so to speak. You can, there you go. Maybe you can see the, the tree likeness of it. Also, I've got all this Java fern that is ready for sprouting and so I just kind of keeping it off to the side and letting it do its thing and then cutting it and starting new grafts as I go um, as well as finding out that these African cribs they really like darkness so I'm allowing like my plants my rotala in the center and my temple plant stuff and some of my other things to grow um, with light in the center anything that's red I'm allowing that but here you can see the difference between if you grow um, undulata, crypt undulata, without light, it turns like a green rather than a crimson. So not necessarily bad things, but this tank is all about hiding spots for these guys. And I'm thinking about cutting loose a bunch of wild shrimp in this tank too, or jade shrimp. The, the, these guys do eat them, and they will definitely eat the babies, as will the endlers. The only thing in this tank that won't are these killifish up top. Um, but that's kind of okay with me in a certain degree. Um, I've got the blue Japanese uh, liar tail endler here. And some females that were newer that um, have yellow on their tail. Uh, in this tank, I had it scaped with uh, Wonderstone from New Mexico, basically. Or uh, I think... Uh, I can't remember if it's key or coke in um, Japanese, but regardless, my wife picked up the stones for this tank, and she picked like brick orange red, and I don't know, a bunch of different colors that kind of didn't, like they looked cool and pretty, but they didn't go together for escape, but this tank, like to put it front and center in the house, she worked on it with me in picking out the materials, but she doesn't do any of the upkeep, so now I'm pretty sure it's been long enough that I can uh, mess around with whatever I want. So, the other thing that's going on in this tank right now, because of that stone, it has a high TDS, I've got a black bottom, um, uh, what do you call it, fish pen here, um, and I'm keeping this kind of in darker, I've been putting plants around the sides of it, but basically what this is, you can see if I zoom in, it is my last batch of shrimp that were born uh, a month ago. Sorry about the shaking. Let me try to get this thing to zoom. I'll scoot it out for you guys for a moment. So in here, we've got um, two blues that didn't make the cut. They're just not solid enough. Um, and so I removed them. And then we've got young, young shrimp that are not sexually mature but they're all um, really red really shrimp. And so there's about 30 of them in here. I know it looks like the guppies are in there, but they're not obviously. Um, so there's about 30 of them in here. I'm trying to keep them in the dark corner so that they get darker because right now they're not the darkest shrimp that I've seen. They're not as dark as their parents, even though they are young, but I wanna darken them up a little bit more for whoever gets them next. Um, and do some trading, hopefully in my club, if anybody wants some, uh, some red reallys that are cheap, 
they're not high end by any means. They're just kind of whatever shrimp. Um, or these blue guys, um, by all means, I'm open to that. Down here, you can see I've also got plants that I pull from. I've got, I'm thinking about putting uh, Mayaka in the other tank. You can see the purple Kabamba that I was talking about earlier that kind of looks like a pine tree. I've also cut the Mayaka and the um, Kabamba so that it looks like a short little stubby pine, like up in the alpine t conditions. And that actually works really well if you don't fertilize the tank. The second you fertilize the tank, it's like, boom, there goes all of your uh, your little plants, and they turn into big, tall plants. So uh, under-fertilizing can actually serve a purpose as long as you keep your plants alive. Um, all right, guys. Well, I don't know if you have any questions. This was going to be kind of, uh, I just wanted to show this tank. The whole point was somebody said you need more plants. And so I was just showing them that there's no shortage of plants. Rachel O'Leary is working on a natural wild type bumblebee shrimp. Uh, yeah. So I really want Rachel's shrimp stock. I really want lots of things. Gimme, gimme, gimme. No. Um, but I just don't have the money. So like this tank was put together, I've pretty much used my shrimp and my guppies to trade my way up and, and my art. You know, I've got lots of art in here. That's what I do for a living, graphic design and art. And so I've got lots of stuff like snowboard designs and, you know, stuff like that that I've been doing. But I've tried to make either art trades or actual um, species of fish and their baby trades. Um to be the way that I've expanded. So I've spent probably $250 to set up that last aquarium we were looking at, the 20 long, and then I've probably spent another $200 in fish and shrimp and stuff, in the in plants in the last, since November, with a big bulk of that being on those cribs, and then another big bulk of that being on um, the and see I don't know what's going on this female's itching and I don't know if she has a parasite or if she's just being weird and has an itch or if she may develop ick so I'm going to keep a close eye on that uh yeah Rachel O'Leary she's so busy so um I hope that I can talk to her the shrimp I really want is a ninja shrimp that can turn colors from Fiji freshwater uh ninja shrimp it's a caradina species um, but I'd love to get my hands on those. I'd like to get my hands on a couple other shrimp. The nice thing is that my TDS in this water is really low. The only thing that's going to be high is going to be the ferts because I'm going to want that red. And so I don't want to harm the shrimp. So that's where Neocaridina are a lot hardier. Um, and the blue, I think, look nice. Red, might, it might be too much red with the plants coming in. They're, I know they look green now, but they will get more red. Uh, yeah, if this hobby wasn't so expensive, I would also have every kind of shrimp. I have been doing the poor man's shrimp tank thing, and I've caught a ton of flack for this online. Everyone seems to be, like, telling me I'm an idiot, but they're not listening to my point, which is one, I'm not professionally breeding anything I'm claiming to be pure strains. But what I do is in all those other tanks, I have uh, females and males of just one color. So just blue, for instance. And they, um, they only breed with each other. So just blues up here. And when I notice a pregnant female blue after she's been pregnant for a week or two, and this requires watching your tanks very closely, I then move her into the nursery tank. In the nursery tank, there are two males that are adults, and I make sure to keep it that way. And I scour this tank, and that's why the plants are floating mostly. I scour this tank and make sure to keep it that way. All the other males stay in breeder boxes hanging out up in other tanks, or I can put up to three in this tank, and I've got catapa leaves and food and plants in with them, but you can see these are my natural colored shrimp, or the cold shrimp, that aren't going to cut any sort of grade, um, but they're kind of cool, and I almost want to include them up top, 
This hobby is meant to learn and have fun. There is no real way you have to do it. I know, but shrimp people are like intense. And so this has like frustrated them to no end. They're like, there's no way you can have tangerine shrimp and red shrimp in the same tank ever. Uh, there's chaos, fire in the streets, cats and dogs will be marrying each other or whatever. Um, but you can. And all you do is you take pregnant females, you completely limit the males, and you make sure to scour and look every day. And it's labor intensive, but I'm a nerd and I like looking at these tanks. And you get rid of the males out of the tank. And then you only put pregnant females that are carrying berries in there. And then uh, after that, you make sure to watch them. And if they have a saddle that's ready to go by the time they um, are in the... So if they're in the tank and they're blue, for instance, and they have a saddle and they're buried, then I will oftentimes take them out. Because that means that as soon as they give birth, they might drop those eggs from their ovaries and or their saddle and bring it down below. Whereas if they are saddled and there's, or they're not saddled and they have berries, eggs, um, there's no chance that they're gonna get pregnant. So I just pull them out the next day after they give birth and watch the tank. And now I've got these teeny tiny baby blue shrimp in this tank with all the other red shrimp. And I come in at night with a flashlight and any shrimp that stays its true color at night doesn't get cold. The rest get cold, pulled, and sold um, to my local fish store or to friends or whoever. But I mean, I've got some Sakura painted fire grade. You can see the red legs there and uh, everything but red eyes. And I've also got Caradina uh, crystal red in here. He was or she was going to be the test subject of like, is it possible to keep them in here in Seattle without RO filtration and stuff, and it's totally possible. So uh, the pet store does it. I have done it um, now successfully. It's been several weeks, so I think it's going to hold out okay. Here's one of those males I was talking about, the super red males. Um, so that one's a male. Uh, I've never heard of female shrimp only can become pregnant when they molt. The males hunt them down and mate with them while they are vulnerable and give them protection. Uh, yeah, our water is super near RO. Bentley's totally right. My tap water is 28 TDS coming out of the tap. So yeah, and yours is 30. So totally, it's because of all the rain here and glacial melt and, and snow melt. Um, yeah, and as far as, yeah, so shrimp, the way they get pregnant is they have to be saddled. And then when they're ready to, they molt, and when their saddle is ready to have eggs come down below, they, I have a video on my channel of, of one of the shrimp actually transitioning, moving her saddled eggs um, down into buried eggs, which is kind of cool. And she's using her tail to like move them into place and then juggling strands of them. But meanwhile, they, they send out a pheromone and then all the males go crazy and hunt her down. They'll even mate with the wrong shrimp. And so I've got a video of that. But if you just watch the process, then you will know that by having two or three pregnant blue shrimp in here at a time, you're not going to get crossing. And there is a slight chance that the babies grow up and you miss a male that stays small and that crossbreeds. Uh, so no, I can't sell these saying that they're a super true line, but I mean, if they're coming out true blue, these ones are true blue and I've done this for three generations. I mean, I think it's working for a hobbyist level, but people just had a conniption fit when they heard that I have, I call it a one tank nursery solution. Um, they just, that's so wrong, I guess. But that's true with guppies and things too. Like these guppies and endlers in this tank, uh, or endlers, I mean, they have two females that are um, rainbow tailed leopard or tiger endlers, which are actually the Lucas Brett's line also that I did not get straight from him, but I wish I had because I also had two extra females that looked plain until they got older 
I don't want to bash where I got them because big channels and, and, you know, I've gotten lots of good products there too. But I got sold some fish with these fish and I bought them as pairs and paid extra money. And they turned out to have blue tails and red tails, the females. So they were. I, I contacted Lucas and he's like, there's no way that that is a rainbow tailed endler. Um, so he helped me out and basically was just like, no, that's not right. You're, you're looking for super plain Jane females that are fairly large and that is what they should look like there. The males should look like this. I've chosen blue and then the spade tail with the little, um, swoosh of a upper, um, uh, dorsal fin. So that's just what I've chosen. I think the yellow pops against the rocks really well. Yet again, it's a color that I'm not using a lot of in this tank, and so you really see it. I may put some Amano shrimp in here. I have noticed that there are some hydra and uh, just algae forming on the back really quickly, and I think that's just because of the ferts and stuff that have gone into this tank. Um, but I want to get some stuff to take care of that. I might throw one more ancestress in here and then move them into the... Uh, big tank later but I've been yapping on for over an hour now and I just wanted to tell you guys how thankful I am for you guys supporting the channel watching viewing um, I'll get back to doing history videos and species videos on the new shrimp coming out on the market new fish there's new rasboras coming out of Myanmar um, there's just all sorts of stuff going on in the world right now of, uh, the hobby. The internet has really opened up all these different styles around the world. And, uh, that shrimp has fish poop caught on its back tail. Interesting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just want to share with you guys my excitement and I hope you can learn something. I hope I learn something when I talk to you guys. I hope you smile when you see this little guy cruising around and do it again. No, 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 Pac-Man style. Um, and the more polished videos that I have that that really touch on hard history. Yeah, I was also thinking about uh, Dario Dario might be good in there. Uh, Chili Rasboras I am leaning towards. Um, maybe... Chili Rasboras, maybe another really small Tetra. There's some weird little plain colored Tetras that are really small. Uh, but I'm not, I don't really worry about the inches rule for tanks. I really have had noticed, I've noticed that the tanks, like this tank at one point had over 50 fish in it and it was doing just fine. The plants were like going crazy without any extra fertilizer. I just do heavy water changes and that's, you know, that's that. And you will lose a couple fish sometimes. But the problem is when you do have a problem and it goes wrong, when they're too tight in a tank, everyone gets something going on. But right now, things are looking good. And, yeah, let, you, let me tell you about overstocking. Yeah, Bentley, I know you got a million rainbow fish. Um, yeah, one cubic inch of fish per gallon is a fairly good rule, but I mean, it totally depends. You can have, literally, you could have, uh, you have a 20 liter that had 300 fish in it three weeks ago. That is insane, Bentley. You're, you're cr talking crazy, um, but I like your style. <clears throat> you're probably giving some Petco employee, a, like, an aneurysm right now. Oh, 20 gallon long. <laughs> that makes more sense, but still. And were they baby fish? Um, but in any case, yeah, so I think that certain landscapes, this one isn't going to carry a heavy load of fish because there's so much rock taking up the water and there's low and slow growing plants in there. But like this with wisteria and fir java ferns, java moss, kabamba, rotalas, I mean, this thing it will just take whatever you put in it, probably. It's just ick and disease are the main thing that you're worrying about. Um, 200 endlers, adults not counting random fry into a local, yeah. Wow. Bentley, what kind of uh, endlers are you raising? I used to have over 100 guppies in a 10 gallon tank that was covered in water sprite. Yeah, if you have guppy grass or java moss or water sprite, you are fine. Like. 
your fish will do okay, especially if you have a soil or a substrate that has now been blanketed and it's really well cycled and balanced. I have kind of tricked out, as everyone I'm sure has, filters with bags of filter media and then cotton batting just galore. And then I've got sponge filter tips on everything. And then I have air stones with filters on those two that can colonize. And then I've got enough substrate that's loose that it can be colonized. Um, so yeah, in any case, I just wanted to show you guys what's going on. My panda guppy lookalikes. Also from the same source as the Endlers that got mixed up. Uh, I'm going to have to call them and talk to them because I paid like 30 bucks for a pair of several different fish and they ended up not being uh, the, the right females. Uh, orange, black Endler, nothing too fancy. Yeah, I like the little orange ones. Uh, if you've been to aquariums then, he has some really cool orange like laser stripe with then like a flag flared tail at the end, like a fork tail of orange that are pretty cool little endlers. I might do a tank over here, honestly, of like, I might keep the, I don't know, that's mean, but maybe I will keep the females in a good sized breeder box or net in the shrimp tank or in this tank for when visitors aren't here and only allow the male leopard endlers to breed with her, but then I could do an all male colony of endlers in here because the male endlers stay at a great size for the tank. Like that's the, the max size I like. Some of the females become behemoths, but as soon as I get that tank to breed again, I, I think I'm gonna switch out the endlers over here. And because of the, let's see here, on the pelvic acromus teniatus, you can see that they've got, um, leopard print on their tails and so i think that'd look cool to have the leopard print endlers in with them so um tank post replanting and removing a large number of fish um yeah so in any case i gotta get rid of these baby um these baby reallys um i don't know what the heck i'm gonna sell them for there's one that's not a really how did it get in there it's probably a really small baby really small baby uh and they're they these are like the lower grade reallys and so we'll see some pet stores don't care like these will darken up as they get older they're only like a quarter to a half inch long right now but um they sell them for like 10 bucks and i think that's ridiculous so i'd rather trade them for store credit and ask them to sell them for like six and get two bucks or something uh, but yeah, this tank is about to have a bunch of Japanese blue, uh, Endler baby fry. You can tell these women are very pregnant. Um, and so we'll see how that goes. We'll see if the cribs eat them <laughs> or if the cribs eat them. Also, there is the male up there, um, hiding with the nice blue. And then we've got the killifish lurking around. They like to hide in this grass. So this tank has become a totally functional tank for the fish's sake and not a pretty to look at tank for my sake anymore. Um, and that's okay for now. I just need to figure out what I'm doing with breeding uh, or have a job that makes some more money um, so that I can afford because right now I need to find a steady graphic design job. At the moment, I I am uh, not working a steady gig. I'm doing like little tiny, like two to five hundred dollar gigs here and there. And in Seattle, where rents like two to five grand uh, easily, you kind of need something more stable than that. So, in any case, I'm hiding uh, the yeah the jungle tank. I'm hiding things around and. Uh, I don't know. I'll talk to you guys later. I just wanted to come on here and say hello and talk that first part about uh, hardscaping and some rules of hardscaping that you don't need to follow, but some of them are kind of helpful to think about. And uh, thank you guys so much for viewing. Uh, it, it rocks that you guys come out and support these live streams and stuff. I just got a new Patreon supporter, even a buck. Like, I was so stoked because that means, you know, I can get things sorted out in the long run with more tanks and stuff, more species. Uh, Bentley, yeah, I will be at the meeting tomorrow. 
uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I am really excited. So, uh, all right, well, DPK uh, Fish Aquariums, thank you for watching the stream. I appreciate it. I'm going to try to keep bringing you better content. I'm learning how to do the YouTube thing. My channel's two months old or two and a half months old. And uh, these tanks are, the oldest is six months old at the moment. Um, I mean, they're older tanks, but they've been up and running steadily for six months. Uh, and so this one and the 40 were up and running before the channel, but the shrimp tank and the other uh, hardscape tank that I was talking about today, that is not even a month old. Or No, it's over a month old. It's about a month and a half old, the hardscape tank. So it's all cycled and everything. I used filter medium and substrate from these other tanks that are doing well. Um, you know, nitrates are like 20 or 30 and the uh, ammonia is at zero. So we're good to go. But thanks guys for joining. It means a lot that you keep checking out my videos, watching them, liking them, sharing them, subscribing. You guys rock. Um, you can go back and watch a lot of stuff about how to make rocks safe, how to keep um, like certain, or how to fix driftwood, how to identify certain rocks and different geology tips, as well as um, some plant profiles. I did Rotala Wallachia today. I did a little silly profile on it. I did an aquascaping profile about how to prepare plants that come in these little cups, um, tissue culture plants. Uh, the other day, that was kind of a smart ass video. I was kind of being a wise guy. But all right, guys, take care. I'll see those of you in Seattle at the meeting tomorrow night. Hopefully, bring in some items to the auction and uh, hopefully getting some cool things. I really want some shrimp. So. Hopefully someone brings some shrimp and maybe some interesting and newbies. So, all right, guys, you take care and swim on. I'll talk to you later.